Um, welcome, um, happy happy summer. Um, welcome to the July uh, 2023 ITBT Transmart Community Meeting. Um, I hope everyone is doing well. I'm sure no matter where you are, you're probably suffering from the heat. So um, hope you're inside staying cool. Um, we have a we have an exciting agenda today. I'm going to go through a few foundation updates, uh, some of the usual ones that you've heard before, um, and then we've got a pretty exciting use case. Um, and I've heard this once before, and I'm pretty excited about uh, seeing it again. Um, so I'll let me just jump into our updates so we can jump into Mark's presentation. Um, I guarantee you that the third week of September is a lot cooler in Boston. So this is the week of our. Um, ITB2 Transmart Symposium. So again, this year we're we're marketing to, to ask people to come for the majority of the week. Um, and I'll tell you why. On Tuesday of that week is the uh, the annual uh, precision medicine conference. Um, the the DBMI is Zach Ohani and his group um, are uh, hosting. Um, it's a pretty, it's really well attended. It's a, always really energetic and very exciting. And the next day is a uh, post-COVID uh, um, AI symposium, which is uh, chock full of um, a lot of really, really uh, wonderful work um, that came out of um, the Mass General Brigham and, uh, it, it, and, and several other people across the country have uh, participated in. They've uh, offered to open this up to the general public. Um, it's going to be in the same venue um, as uh, our symposium. So that will be that will be pretty exciting. And then of course, Thursday and Friday um, will be uh, the I2B2 um, uh, Transmart Symposium and a lot of excitement we have. We're only in July, but we have almost 120 people that have registered already, which is really amazing for this time. Usually everybody registers right at the end because we don't charge for the conference. So I think we're gonna have a pretty good turnout. We're offering it virtual and in person, although, if you can make it to Boston, please do. That's I think that's where you get the, the most value. I am not gonna walk through this agenda, but I'm just to, to give you a couple of really quick highlights. The keynote will be um, you know, AI, the AI revolution in uh, medicine, chat GBT, Zach Ohani. Um, that should be pretty exciting. We're gonna give you an update on our digital twin journey and the work that we're doing and how that's moving forward. Um, the Enact group. Uh, will be coming uh, to, to give us uh, an update on sort of their, their next generation network. They're sort of relaunch. They're calling it a relaunch. So um, very excited to hear uh, Sham and, and his uh, colleagues talk about what's on the docket for an act. Um, and then it, data, model, data model interoperability, that's a major, major focus of the work that we're doing right now to um, allow I2B2 to work, to work on top of uh, PCORnet and also OMOP. We'll have somebody from the Odyssey uh, community uh, as part of that panel. And then of course, uh, REDCap with all the work that Recover's doing. We've got a lot going on with I2B2, a new release coming. We'll go in, I'll go into that on a couple other slides. Um, use cases from the community. And then the second day will be more of a technical um, deep dive. We um, one of the things we talked about was um, asking folks that come in person to bring, if they've created a, um, a poster that they've uh, presented in the past, if they want to bring that and actually have uh, five minutes to uh, talk about their poster, we can you know, highlight people's work. So you'll be hearing more about that. So keep that in mind if you, you've got something you want to um, showcase um, here. A release is coming this fall. I'm going to zoom through these slides really, really quickly, uh, but I did want the slides in the deck. Um, I think you've heard we've got a new brand new user interface that's being um, rolled out um, in this release. Um, all, all of the existing functionality will be included um, in, the, in the release. Um, uh, breakdowns, visualiz visualizations, uh, printable queries, um, uh, the legacy plugins are all backwards compatible. So I think folks have had said they're pretty excited about that. Um, a lot of a lot of power here, which I won't go into. And then one one last uh, piece on this is that we believe um, that the funding that has supported this will continue for another year. 
So we want to get your feedback. We want you to, to adopt this and kick the tires and, and you know, let us know what you think. Um, and, and hopefully we can continue to build out functionality within that UI. Uh, OMOP, uh, ITB2 on OMOP, you've heard uh, Jeff Plan uh, talk about this. You know, why? Well, Odyssey, the Odyssey community is everywhere. A lot of people are maintaining the um, OMOP uh, data model and, you know, so it's it's really important. We also believe that our new user interface uh, will be really complementary to the Odyssey community. And so we're, we're in the process of um, talking to that group, engaging with them. They've got a conference in uh, the fall that we've uh, submitted a talk uh, to. So if we get accepted, we'll, we'll be participating in that uh, forum as well. Uh, I won't go into this too much. I to be too for Cornet um, OMOP, wiring up OMOP. You've heard about this. I'll just buzz through. If, if you want to get involved, a little bit more involved in the foundation, join one of our working groups. Um, the other thing I want to mention is that if we believe that we should be spinning up a, a new user, uh, a new working group, um, maybe social determinants of health. Maybe people really want to get together and talk about that and how to make that work. That will be our um, next speaker. They'll jump into that, but something like that. Um, let us know. We can certainly support that type of thing. Um, we're always looking for agenda topics for our community meetings. Um, September, there won't be one in September because of the symposium, but we've got a meeting in, in November. So we're always, always interested in, in hearing your thoughts. So um, that was my quick update. And now we're going to jump into the, the meat of the, uh, the, the community meeting. So Mark, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you very much, Diane. <clears throat> Excuse me. Good morning, everyone. Um, let me share my screen. Okay, am I projecting? Yes, you are. Okay. All right, so hi everyone. My topic is enhancing I2B2 patient data with social and environmental determinants of health, which we call CEDO. I would like to discuss an ontology and toolkit from University of Southern California. My name is Mark Abajian and um, I'll, uh, I'd like to um, let you know that I am uh, representing USC here today, uh, University of Southern California, and our team that developed the ontology and toolkit, but I am no longer affiliated with USC. Uh, let's uh, go on to the next slide. <clears throat> so just an overview of my talk, I'd like to just introduce myself to you, tell you why I'm here, explain the argument. And so you may ask Mark, why is there an argument about CEDO? I'll explain in a moment. Um, the who's who, who was involved in our ontology and uh, toolkit development. Uh, I'd like to explain the data sources where we get our social and environmental determinants from. Um, then I'll go into a description of the ontology. We'll take a look at that and uh, open it up in I2B2 with a live demo. Um, I'll show you, um, explain to you about the toolkit. And just a caveat, I have not been involved in the development of the toolkit. So my, um, my information on there is, is not 100%, uh, but I'll do the best I can to describe that. Um, and then just leave you with some resources. And if you have questions, I'll be happy to answer those. So first of all, who am I? Mark Abajian, I have over 30 years of uh, experience in software development, system administration, IT, et cetera. Uh, the last four years that I was working, I was in informatics software, uh, working with the clinical research informatics team at University of Southern California. I found it fascinating work. I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed working with I2B2, Shrine, and the folks at, um, at Harvard and partners, et cetera. Okay. I'm now retired from USC and had a 21-year career with Caltech and JPL, retired from them also. I'm a native of, native of Los Angeles. Fluent in Armenian. I'm, I'm here volunteering today. Uh, like I said, I'm no longer affiliated with USC, but I do want to share um, this developments with you all. And so um, representing the clinical research informatics team, which is part of the Keck School of Medicine at the University of Southern California. 
Okay, so why am I here? Well, um, you know, I mentioned uh, to Diane that I might have a topic and she said, Mark, this is a hot topic. Come and talk to us about it. I had mentioned this at the Harvard Symposium last year in September um, during the day two when uh, Michelle Morris was leading the talk on her ontology working group. I mentioned that we have, we're working on an ontology and a toolkit for CEDO. Uh, we've just released a, a journal article. It's just been published. So that's another reason why I wanted to come to you and share today. Um, the toolkit um, has a new software release. It's on GitHub. Uh, we're recruiting beta testers. And after all, sharing is caring. And so I want to make sure that um, what we've developed, um, I know that it was intended to be shared with the ITB2 community. And so I want to make sure that people are aware of that. So getting back to the argument, and like I said, you may ask, Mark, what is the argument involved here? And I want to say, well, um, it was kind of a, a trick to get you to listen. Um, there's no argument here. It's not a dispute about what we have to do with CEDO. I'm using the word argument in terms of a synopsis or abstract. And so what is our synopsis? Synopsis is there should be a way to make our patients' social and environmental data available to our I2B2 researchers. And so at USC, we had been looking at this for a while. Our directors decided there must be a way to do this. And I think they knew already there was a way to do it. We just had to find the time and the resources to get it done. This is going to uh, give us data that are objective, not subjective, it's not patient reported social determinants. These are data that are coming from reliable published sources. They're periodically updated by government agencies. And so these are data that, are, that reflect what are the social and environmental factors in an area where a patient lives. And these are precise data they're available on a per census tract basis. And so when we're looking at information about a patient, we know that we're not getting generalized data, for example, for all of Southern California. This is down to the census tract. Okay, and with this information, researchers can infer causality, identify trends in the patient population. That's a, that's a great thing. I'm sure everyone who's on the call already knows that this is a, a an extraordinary thing to be able to add to your I2B2 data set. And I'll just say that um, as our directors said, and in the immortal words of Oscar Goldman from the 1970s television show, The Six Million Dollar Man, we have the technology and so let's do it. So what was the plan? Plan was number one, identify sources of CEDO data. Where are we gonna get these data from? collect the CEDO data for our region, identify the best practices for geocoding the patient addresses because we have to find a way to determine for each patient which census tract are they already are they actually in. And then, geo, that's, um, then, and then actually perform the geocoding of the patient addresses, mapping them to the census tracts. We developed an ontology for the CEDO data for use in I2B2. And then we enhance the patient records using the CEDO data. And then the, beyond the ontology and the gathering of the CEDO data, the last step was something that we just determined in the last couple of years is we should absolutely do this, automating steps two and four and six and building a toolkit so that the lessons that we learned in collecting the data, geocoding and enhancing the patient data can be shared with the I2B2 community and others who are interested in this type of thing. So who did this exactly? Well, we're the clinical research informatics team at the Southern California Clinical and Translational Science Institute, which is part of the Keck School of Medicine at the University of Southern California. Um, Keck School of Medicine supports the Keck Medicine, um, which consists of three or four hospitals. Um, it's a CTSA, and aside from the Keck hospitals, there's also the uh, Los Angeles County um, Department of Health has a um, a, uh, well, that's the County Department of Health, and they have a large um, uh, general hospital in Los Angeles. Um, we work with them. We also partner with the Children's Hospital of Los Angeles. Um, the director uh, of clinical research informatics uh, was Daniela Meeker. And so around 2017, 2018, she started making sure that our I2B2 
folks could get involved in building an ontology uh, for getting these data into the system. Uh, she partnered with our other director, Juan Espinoza. He um, is a physician at Children's Hospital Los Angeles. Uh, they engaged um, uh, with uh, Dr. Uh, John Wilson. He's a director of the Spatial Sciences Institute, which is also at USC. Uh, he brought in his um, um, GIS or ge um, um, geographical information system admin, uh, Bo McDonald, and together they decided uh, where can we get these data from and how are we going to get it. Um, they brought in our data admin, Amy Schwong, uh, who does the uh, ETL for our um, patient addresses. Um, <clears throat> And then more recently, and starting in 2019, they asked me to join and bring in a develop an ontology for putting these data in. Um, we changed um, leadership at, at, at our team. Neil Barus came in as a new director. Um, he brought in Paul Kingsbury as program manager. And the two of them really pushed for um, this toolkit, building a, uh, a toolkit to maintain, retain all of the um, all the lessons that we learned from building this. Um, Praveen Angyan joined the team as a toolkit architect. He's now the applications lead for, um, for uh, that team. Um, and they brought in last year, Hakko Babajian as toolkit engineer to build the toolkit. So um, this is uh, how things were uh, originally. Um, the, everyone who's highlighted here in red is, um, is a uh, leader of the uh, clinical research informatics and was responsible for directing all of this. Um, I'd like to say there have been transitions since we started this. Dr. Meeker and, es and Dr. Espinoza have, um, have left the team. Um, I have retired from the team. Paul Kingsbury is, um, has left USC also, but the rest of the people who are on this list, well, everyone on this list is an author of the paper. And, um, the people who are not um, highlighted in gray are still members of the team and still working on this project. So we discussed basically introductions and who is involved in this. And now I'd like to discuss the, the meat of the CEDO data and ontology and go on to the toolkit and share some resources with you. So first of all, the data sources. There's many data sources. Uh, the largest one we have is the American Community Survey, which comes, I believe, from the U.S. Census Bureau, although don't quote me on that. Uh, this provides us with 29 measures of race, ethnicity, education, income, housing, and economic stability. These are, data are available. Um, they're published, I believe, once a year, and they're published on a five-year moving average once a year. And... Um, it's for every census tract in the US. And so it's a huge, a huge set of data that we can make use of. The uh, US, uh, US Department of Agriculture uh, provides a atlas for food access research that provides us with two measures of food access. Centers for Disease Control provides something called the Social Vulnerability Index, which is based on 15 social factors. Um, ESRI, which is, I believe, not a government agency, but a proprietary uh, tool, the ESRI Business Analyst and Info USA provided us with something that we call liquor store density or alcohol access. Um, the Cal Enviro Screen or California, from the California Environmental Protection Agency provides us with five measures of air quality and water quality, but caveat, this is for California only. And then there's the Southern California Environmental Health Sciences Center, which is also part of the Keck School of Medicine at USC. And they have four measures of air quality for Southern California only. Caveat, these data are quite old. They date from 1998 to 2009. And so it's something, one of the first things we adopted was these data because they were very available for us. And, um, but they're not exactly something that we would recommend using in the toolkit for future things, unless you have historical data in Southern California that you want to be able to get to. So again, this is the list of resources that we currently have, or last time I looked, what we had at Keck. Um, and what, we're, what we've changed in, in the toolkit is highlighted here 
Um, you'll notice that we now have data from NASA, uh, National Aeronautics and Space Administration, which is two measures of air quality uh, for the entire country. Um, the uh, Cal EPA, we've reduced to um, four measures instead of five measures. And we've kind of de-emphasized the, um, the data that are for Southern California only. It's not, it's not um, ingested by default when you run the toolkit. So let me, let me uh, mention about the ontology now. Here you see a um, example of the I2B2 interface where I've inserted a social and environmental determinants of health domain. Um, and I'll show this to you in a moment. Uh, first, let me say that uh, when we were looking for existing resources for CEDO ontologies in 2019, we really couldn't find any. Uh, there were some diagnostic codes in ICD that were for diagnoses for an individual and not really indicative of exposure. Um, and so when we're talking about exposure, we're talking about, you know, for, for given a patient address, based on where this address is, um, according to what census tract it's in, we can pull in data that tell about the neighborhood where that patient is. It's, it gives us a general idea of an exposure for a person living in that area, but it's not an actual diagnosis of that per person's social or environmental determinants. So ICD was not going to be appropriate for us. And then for LOINC, as far as I could tell, they had, they had announced an exposure ontology, but one had not been released yet. And so we were unable to take any advantage of, of that. So we kind of built our own custom ontology. I was responsible for that. And um, that was quite a lot of fun, actually. We modeled specifically for using an I2B2. Um, there were challenges involved because I had never built an ontology before. Um, we realized that exposures um, in this sense are not clinical encounters. And of course, everything, all the observation facts in I2B2 are based on clinical encounters. So this is a little bit different. And then building the ontology in a way that the user experience, user interface is useful, um, that was um, a nice challenge. I enjoyed that in terms of naming these items, coding them, putting in tool tips, understanding how to build the filters, et, uh, et cetera. Um, that, was, uh, that was a lot of fun. So here's a picture of our ontology. And I'd like to leave the demonstration, excuse me, I'd like to leave the slideshow right now and go to a demonstration. So let's see, where are we? Okay. Am I still sharing my screen? Yes, looks good. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we're looking at the um, data enclave um, that I2B2 uses for developers. Thank you very much to Michael Mendes and to Diane for um, getting this uh, available for me. I was able to join this data enclave and install my uh, CEDO ontology here. Let's see, that looks good, okay. I think I want to blow this up a little more so it's easier to see. Okay, so here we are, I've opened this up. You'll notice the first thing that you see here in the ontology is a version number. Um, and then there's some notes here. And these are notes we put in here to explain how to use this. Okay, so this is, um, we'll just skip that for now. But here, here you can see the ontology. Um, alcohol access, that's a liquor store density. Uh, drinking water quality indicator, population density, persons per square mile, excuse me, it's square kilometer, um, but, but I said square mile. And so, you know, if I were to use this, it's going to ask me what kind of population density are you searching for? And you can select persons per square mile or persons per square kilometer. And so, for example, if we can say we want something that's um, Let's say we want something that's not very 
high population density. We put that in there. And you can see with this gets added in as square kilometers. Um, so those filters, those were um, exciting for <laughs> to, uh, to work on. Uh, unemployment rate, um, air quality indicators. We have a number of these different air quality indicators from a couple of different sources. Like I said, um, the Cal Enviro screen, uh, and then also the Southern California um, Environmental Health uh, Science Center. This, um, uh, these things, um, as you can see, we have tool tips associated with each one. I'm sorry, the tool tips do not get um, uh, zoomed in when, uh, when we do this. So they're kind of small to read on the screen, but we prepared information on what all of these things, what each of these measures means um, in the tool tips. We have something that's a social burden child dependency ratio, old age dependency ratio. Um, most of these data come from the uh, American Community Survey or ACS. And again, these are on a yearly basis, a five-year moving average, I believe is how they're presented uh, to us. And um, um, we have, uh, what else do we have here? Ethnicity, uh, some uh, measures for food, some measures for housing. There's actually a measure, for example, of this one here, for example. What percentage of households in this census tract where the patient lives, what percentage of those households, occupied units, we'll call them, are lacking a complete kitchen? Here's one. What percentage of occupied units have no internet subscription? I think these are fascinating things. I'm not sure how they get the data, but they are, do make it available. Um, there's a, a couple of things here for income. What's the median household income? Uh, how far below the poverty level do you want to search for uh, information about patients? I'm sorry, was there a question? Okay. So a couple of indices here. Um, the Gini inequality coefficient. Um, social vulnerability index, again, that comes from the CDC. Uh, percentage of households in the census tract that have limited English. And then race. And this is not the race of the patient. This is the race of what percentage of the population in that census tract is American Indian, or what percentage of the population in that census tract is Black. And again, you know, you can take one of these and drop it over here and say, well, for example, I want to look for patients where the um, population of white uh, people is less than or equal to 20%. I want, in other words, I want to look for um, um, you know, a, a population that is more ethnically mixed. So um, these are the kinds of things that we have available in our um, in our um, ontology. Um, are there any questions about this before I return to the slideshow? I would okay. suggest um, people just yes. unmute. I know Michelle had a question about how is the data connected to the patient, but I, I'll, I'll let uh, people just unmute and ask questions. It's probably easier. All right, so regarding how are, how are the patients, how are the data connected to the patients? Well, when I talk about the toolkit, I'll explain how we do that. But let me say in general, the, what we do is we, um, we, um, we get the patient addresses, connect them with a census tract. We look up the data in that census tract and apply that to, a, um, to the record. Um, an enhanced address record. That address record is then folded back into I2B2 by populating a observation fact table with these with these data. And so, so there's an the, we, go ahead. So Mark, so there's just a couple of facts that you have to add to your I2B2 per patient to be able to take advantage of all these uh, variables. Um, when you say a couple of facts, you have to add to your patient. Each like, one. Yeah, go ahead. What's your question? Like you don't like you have a lot of variables here, but you don't have a fact. Every patient doesn't have every fact here, right? It's you're just, every patient has every fact. Yes. Like as long as the as long as the address where they live 
-hmm. is in a census tract that can be located. And we have data from the sources for that particular census tract, then yes, that patient will have uh, a piece of data for each one of these measures. That's a lot of data. You might want to have a separate, uh, a separate table that's not part of your clinical observations, clinical observation facts, but have a separate table specifically for your, um, for your CEDO observation facts. So you so use, uh, we use multiple, multi we use multiple, we use multiple fact tables. But you can use the observation fact table as well. Um, you can, can, absolutely, yes. Um, but I was wondering, is, go ahead. One of the question is, uh, when you link the record, do you use the linkage at the block level, block ID level? What is the uh, granularity of geocoding that you use in terms of linking with the patient? Uh, the geocoding is done to identify the census tract. And so- And, and census tract has different uh, layers. I'm asking, which one do you use? Do you use the block ID? That's a great question. And the fact is, I don't know the answer to that. So, <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't, oh, I can't help you with so, that. If people have the choice, right? They can go, you know, the most granular is linking by the, uh, the uh, linking by the geolocation, which we do not have data for in the ACS data. And you are bringing data from different sources and data from different sources are having different levels of granularity. Uh, for example, ACS can have the most granular to be the block ID, that means part of a street. Um, it could be zip code for environmental data. I know a lot of the data set only would give by zip codes. Um, so the, the linkage would be by the granularity that the data that is available. Um, so I understand that you don't have much information about it. Uh, however, whatever the resources you are uh, publishing, if that kind of information is available, I think it is helpful for people who does not have uh, much knowledge about this kind of data sets, um, then they could um, think about this better. Yeah, so I'm, I guess I'm a little bit confused. So each of these facts are linked to a specific census tract. So you just- so like at, the, at the end, Michelle, I, wanna, I think I can answer that <laughs> and Mark can help to see if this is correct. At the end, information is connected to the patient. So but the idea individual, is- individual like air quality indicator and- Yeah, so the idea you... is Abu Mosa living in a zip code of 65203. Right. And I have address too, right, myself. Mm -hmm. So if American Community of Survey has the socio-demographic information, part of the street that I live in, that's the most granular information you, you are getting. So then Abu Mosa or my neighbor are in the same socio-demographic status. So mm -hmm. they would put my income and all the other information as a percentile information instead of saying Abu Mosa is from... Asia or Bangladesh, right? Is gonna say that, oh, in that street, there are 20% Asian, 60% white, and 20% black, something like that. Right, but um, just, and that's gonna be to connected to, to every individual that is in the database. That means- but Do you have to do that, that is the my question. Problem. Do you have to store every fact on a patient or do you only need their geocoding fact in your observation fact table? And then the query will determine what are the uh, parameters or the, the, the different codes, geocodes that it needs to scoop up the patients. I just, I, I guess I'm confused if why you would have all these facts in your observation fact and not just the geocode fact and allow the ontology um, to figure out who's in and who's out instead of storing each individual fact. I don't know if that if that's what's happening or I'm just misunderstanding. 
as far as I understand, we are storing each individual fact. And um, Michelle, you and I should have a discussion about um, how the ontology can help filter during a query, because for us, it's, it's all the all the facts are stored. Okay. I mean, it's a gorgeous ontology. I mean, I, I like it a lot. Uh, and maybe we will get to adopt this in an act. But I just am concerned about the number of facts that people would be maintaining. And I feel like maybe they wouldn't have to, but I have to- <laughs> well, I think, Michelle, it can be implemented the way you are proposing. And we have done this for agent encounter and a couple of other computed variables. So if you store technically uh, the geocode information with, with having the additional information in additional table, it could be implemented in the data layer. Um, that means Mark and their team has to do some further innovation to, to provide those tools. Okay. Or someone else has to take their, else, right. take it <laughs> so out. We're, yeah. cer we're certainly interested in collaborating with people who are interested in collaborating with us. Yeah, I mean, this is great information and it's organized very well. Uh, I, I, I do imagine a couple tweaks, like, you know, because when I think about it, I think about all the different sites having to do this ETL, and I'm like, ooh, yes. I'm not going to be the one to ask them to do that. <laughs> but if I could say, hey, if you just put this geocode and whatever Mosa said, uh, Jeep code, and this, like, I'm not familiar with them at all, but if I could say, hey, if you add these three facts, we can get all this information um, that I would be more, com more comfortable with uh, uh, asking <laughs> without getting killed. <laughs> but, yeah, Mark, do you want to explain Michelle, to us? If you would, Michelle, if you would like to add um, that particular question to a future ontology working group um, I will, meeting, sure. then I'll be happy to join and discuss with you. Okay, we'll see you Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hey, Mark. Yes. Mark, oh. Michael. Uh, I have a, probably a dumb question here, uh, but just to clarify, am I understanding correctly the way this ontology works is that you associate patient to a geocoding group, right? You are not associating that, you are not trying to asso associate in least some of the data to the individual level, correct? Like uh, education or income, um, you're basically uh, education or income. So yeah, what this says is, th so this fact here, this education, when you're looking at this, what you're looking at is when you're doing a query in I2B2 using this fact, what you're saying is, show me the patients who live in a census tract where the percentage of high school graduates who are age 25 or over, or excuse me, with percentage, yeah, percentage of the population has graduated high school is a particular number. And so if you want, to, you're looking for a census tract, for example, where 80% of the population age 25 and over has graduated high school, then you would put this over here, drag it over here and say, okay, then I want people in the census tract who, who the census tract has more than 80% of high school graduates. Mm -hmm. And so you're not identifying specifically whether your patient has graduated high school or not, but you're identifying that that patient, you're identifying those patients that live in a census tract that has that number. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. That, that, that answered my question. Thank you. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Mark, um, I, I have, I have one question. You are yes. adding air quality indicators. How often is it like an annual air quality ind indices or is it a monthly? How often do you update the uh, well, observation is, How often do you want to run the toolkit to get new data in? Um, this one, California EnviroScreen, I believe that's yearly or, or biannual. Um, and so, you know, you would want to run the toolkit every time you have a new batch of patients that you want to get data for, but the toolkit brings in the latest data also. And so, um, and so you can update data by, by running the toolkit again. 
okay. Um, how often should that be? Well, it's, it's up to how often you want to run that. I think that the data come in once a year, but I'm not 100% sure on that. We do have information online that explains um, how, what year we used in, um, in our uh, data, in our I2B2, and how often those data come in. Okay. Let me get Thank back you. to the slideshow, and then I'll see if um, maybe the rest of your questions can be answered by the remainder of my slides. So um, let's see. So uh, we looked at the ontology. I wanted to share some caveats with you. Um, our ontology was tested originally with I2B2 version 1709C and 1712A. I recommend that you use multiple fact tables because you might want to um, might want to update your clinical facts more often than you update your um, the other facts, and so you might want to have just a separate table for the for the CEDO data. Um, I, as I mentioned earlier, the patient exposures to CEDO measures are not part of a clinical encounter. So if they're not part of a clinical encounter, how do you get them in I2B2? Because the, um, uh, the database, the star schema, requires that uh, there be an encounter. So we, we created things that we call pseudo visits so that we can um, uh, create an observation fact and tie it to the patient through a pseudo visit. So, turns out that the date constraints on a pseudo query, pseudo query terms, if you put pseudo query terms in group one, group two, group three of the I2B2 um, and then apply a date constraint, it's not going to work so good because it's not really meaningful. And so um, we found that if you can build a temporal query where you're setting, like, I want to make sure that the first exposure to this happened before that diagnosis and, and that type of thing, a temporal query is a much better alternative to using a date constraint. Date constraints, trust me, are not really meaningful in this um, in the CEDO context. Um, you saw some notes in the ontology tree that was the dark red um, text that was at the very beginning of the uh, of our uh, tree. That's not a standard usage of the I2B2 ontology. It's something that we came up with because we wanted to. We knew we could show a version because I I saw how uh, Michelle was doing that for the ACT ontology. And we just kind of adopted that and, and adapted it so that we can put more notes in there also. But the uh, notes in the tree uh, can lead to rendering issues. When you go to more info, it doesn't look so good if you try and do a more info on a note. Uh, a minor update to the web client can remedy that, but I have no um, uh, code for that update right now. So um, it's time to jump into the toolkit and see what that can do for us. We call our toolkit Sunday. That's a social and environmental determinants address enhancement tool. Somebody was thinking about ice cream, I guess, uh, and they decided to call it Sunday. Um, the internal name, we call it the GIS toolkit, and you'll find the GIS toolkit name is used, um, for example, on our GitHub, um, but officially it's called Sunday. Functionality is that it geocodes patient addresses, it downloads CEDO data from the agencies, it enhances the patient addresses with the CEDO data, and how do you need to run this? Well, it runs on, on Linux, Mac OS, and, uh, and Windows. Um, uh, you'll, need a, uh, you'll need denominated patient addresses. Um, and so what do I mean by that? I kind of made up this term here, denominated. I mean, de-identified patient addresses. Make sure the name's not on there. So, you know, I, the patient address someone pointed out to me, that's already identified data. You know, you can identify someone from their address, but if you take off their name, that makes it a little bit safer to use and more private. Uh, you might want to possibly do the geocoding from a non-institutional server, but that's the discussion for a later time. Um, if you're running on Mac OS, it requires Python, but the other um, Linux and Windows have, I think, Python built into the executable. So um, that's not an issue there. Um, if you're going to geocode addresses, it'll want to cache the geocoding results and you need a PostgreSQL database for it to be able to do that. An alternative to that database is being um, implemented, but that has not been announced yet in our toolkit. So again, the functionality, let's go in a little more detail. Geocoding the patient addresses, we start with street addresses with no, uh, with no names, or you can provide lats and lawns if you have that. Um, 
valid date ranges. Um, again, we have to know which census version to look at, the 2000 decennial event, the census, 2010, 2020. And so we need to be able to say which censuses do we need to look at for each patient address. And from there, we can associate it with the appropriate data set version that comes from the agencies. Which sets of CEDO data can we apply to that particular address? Um, output gives us census tract IDs and lats and longs. Um, the results are cached when you geocode, like I said, in the Postgres database. So the next time you run it, it'll be a lot faster. We download the CEDO data. Uh, you give it a list of the input, uh, input a list of the desired CEDO measures and sources. The default is 38 measures from a number of different sources. Output is the CEDO data files downloaded from the sources. I don't have an example to show you, but these are basically CSV files that are downloaded from the sources. Uh, the American Community Survey has a different um, API for downloading data, but these data are also cached in, um, in a file on your system. Um, and uh, next, uh, enhancing patient addresses. There are two modes for that. Uh, the first is the comprehensive mode. And the other one is called the latest mode. In the comprehensive mode, all the CEDO data sets released over the years are matched up with the census tracts and dates for the patient addresses. Um, and with output from that is an Excel workbook, one worksheet for each CEDO measure. And on that worksheet, you'll see each address in a row um, and a date specific value is associated with that address. Um, on the next worksheet, it'll be a different CEDO measure. And so there will be 38 worksheets um, in that Excel workbook. Uh, in the latest mode, it only uses the latest data for each um, CEDO, uh, for each measure, it uses the latest data. It assumes that the patient addresses are all current. And so, um, and it only uses the latest uh, census tracts uh, for that. And so there are a lot of assumptions made in that. This runs a lot faster. You get only one, um, one um, measure, one value of each measure for each address. But this is good for, for testing your system, for example, if you wanted to run only the latest mode. So uh, output from that is a single CSV file. Um, I'll mention just briefly execution, Linux, Windows, and Mac OS. Um, the way that you invoke it is different per OS, but the command line options are the same for each one. There's more information on this in the wiki that's associated with the toolkit. I have some example files I wanted to show uh, to you. Let me go through those. I hope I can do that on the, quick, on the quicker side. Uh, just a moment, please. Leave the thing. Okay, input data set. Here's an input data set where we have 10 addresses. You'll see the street name, city, state, zip code, county, address start date, and address end date. And by that, we mean that the patient who lived at this address in Atascadero, California, lived there from August of 2011 to August of 2016. This column here, address ID, is important because this is what ties us back to the patient dimension table. And so um, uh, the address ID is, a, so you, you've got to have another uh, table somewhere that associates an ad, each address ID you can have multiple addresses for the same patient, but each address ID has to be able to be tied back to a patient. And so that address ID is, um, is shown here. When you run the geo, when you run it, uh, the toolkit, one of the first things it does is geocode the patient address. And so the output file from that will give us, um, I've highlighted here in dark red, a spatial geo ID, which is basically an identifier for the census tract and the latitude and longitude. So that's what comes back after geocoding. Then when you um, um, when the it does the enhancement, it's taking each of those addresses and associating it with with the CEDO data. You'll see at the bottom of this screen, you'll see a, a different number of different tabs. Um, these tabs there's 38 different tabs here in this Excel workbook. Um, there's 38 different tabs. Where each one corresponds to one of the CEDO measures. Oops, sorry. Uh, let's go to um, let's go to this one over here. I highlighted this one over here. Okay, this one is um, 
age of the housing, I believe. Um, and let's go back, let's take a look at this one. We talked about Atascadero, California a moment ago. And that was, um, someone was living there from 2011 to 2016 at that address. Well, the, the measure that we have for this address is from 2011, only for the year 2011. And so there's one measure there, but guess what? Here's another record here that has another value for this CEDO measure uh, for the year 2012. And so this start date and end date um, gets uh, developed um, for, um, you know, what are the different values that we have for the different years where the patient was living there? Here's a Tascadero again for 2013. Here's a Tascadero again for 2014. And so you get the idea that what well, we started out with 10 addresses, but this particular CEDO measure has what here? Uh, 49 rows associated with it, something like that, 49 or 50 rows. The 10 addresses became 50, uh, 50 rows. And because there's multiple values for each address based on the year uh, that CEDO data um, was generated. And so this is the comprehensive, when you run comprehensive mode, this is an example of the Excel workbook that you get with multiple values for each address, depending on, um, on um, the dates that, uh, that match up with the CEDO data. This is the output from the latest mode. When you run in latest mode, the 10 addresses, um, they got geocoded. And then the latest information for each CEDO variable is shown here. And so 10 addresses, you start out with 10 addresses, you get 10 rows back. And so you have 38 measures here. Again, each of those 38 measures, there's only one value it's the latest value for that measure. I think this could be very useful in testing, although I don't think you want to have a limited data set like this when you are um, actually enhancing your, your data for your, your patient data in I2B2. Okay, so getting back over here, we're just about ready to finish up. Um, okay, so we talked about the ontology, the toolkit, I want to leave you with this list of resources. The first one is our point of contact at, for clinical research informatics and for the toolkit and ontology at USC is Praveen Angyan. He is the applications lead of the clinical research informatics group. Um, there's his email address. Um, the paper that we published recently, Sunday, a resource for expanding research into social and environmental determinants of health. It's available at this DOI. Corresponding author is Neil Barus, and the lead author was Paul Kingsbury. The toolkit is available on GitHub. The latest release is tagged version 2.3. That was uh, uploaded to GitHub just a couple of weeks ago. So that's very fresh. Uh, there's a wiki on GitHub also. In the wiki, you can find uh, files that we use to develop the ontology. Um, and so uh, the toolkit and ontology are both there. Details on the CEDO data sources and details on the CEDO data measures, we have a link to those also. Let me show you briefly what that looks like. So data sources is a table explaining each of these data sources, American Community Survey, Cal EPA, CDC, USDA. There should be a row in here for NASA also that hasn't been um, put in yet. And then the data elements. Each of the 38 data elements that we discussed is described here. Um, and um, this should answer any questions you have about what those data elements mean. Um, going back to this I2B2 client, um, if you have access to the data enclave, it's dataenclave.net um, slash web client. Um, there's a web client version two, although our we, our notes here do not render very well in version two of that. So just a heads up on that. Um, you can log into this if you go to the data enclave. Um, this is, happens to be associated with the username called SDOH. And so SDOH is how you would log in to see that if you're interested. Um, and um, that basically is the end of my presentation. I wanna thank you for your attention. Um, you know, I, like I said, I'm here as a volunteer. 
I'm not getting paid to do this. And so I'd like to ask anyone who's interested to unmute your, your Zoom and applaud. Great work, Mark. Well, really thank you so work. much. I appreciate the uh, uh, oh. presentation, Mark. Very exciting. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any additional questions, please let me know. Very good. Thanks, Thanks everyone. So much. Great job. That was amazing. And again, if we want to spin up a quick, you know, ad hoc, you know, working group to to dive deeper into this, maybe we could convince Mark to volunteer a little bit more of his, <laughs> of his knowledge. So, so certainly, and we'll have these um, the slides and the recording posted on the the website um, shortly. So, awesome. Any hey, last... thank you very much, Diane, for giving me the opportunity to share with everyone. All right. All right. I know folks have to jump to another meeting. Any last minute? No. Okay, terrific. All right, great. Well, I, you know, join the ontology working group on Thursday. If um, I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure uh, Michelle will be talking about this some more on Thursday at her her group. So, all right. Yeah. See you thanks. guys. Thanks, everyone. Thank Bye. you.